All right. Yeah, and there's there's people showing up on YouTube right now, so the count's going up. And it's 903, okay. Let me just send a note to uh I should have students joining this as well, and they might not have remembered. Oh, I, I wanted to ask as well. Can you see my mouse pointer if I move it around? Can I can I point to things using that, or do I need? Yeah, to yeah, do yeah, else? yeah. You can see it. Yep. Okay, okay, right. Oh, great. Yeah, we got people uh, coming in now. Great. Uh, excellent. All right. And people kind of show up as we go. So um, it's pretty, pretty laid back. So what we usually do is just just have you, you know, give your talk. And if people have questions, they can ask them whenever they want, you know, as like a seminar mm -hmm. style. And um, and then, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's typically about an hour, but like, don't worry, don't like freak out about time or anything. If you end up going a little bit over, you know, lots of people do, it's, it's no problem. Just, uh, you mm -hmm. know, we'll just kind of go as we go, you know, Does that sound good. Great. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So are you ready to, to start now? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so thanks everybody for, uh, attending, uh, yet another Colloquium talk. Um, this week we have uh, Mitchell uh, Riley. Is that how I pronounce it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. That's what I thought. Mitchell Riley, who's a, um, a PhD student at Wesleyan University working with uh, uh, Dan Licata. Um, and today uh, he's going to be telling us about their work on um, extending homotopy type theory with linear type formers, which I'm personally excited about because it's, you know, somewhat related to things that I think about. So um, hopefully everyone else is going to really enjoyed it. So thank you, uh, Mitchell. It's really nice to have you uh, here as a speaker. Uh, great. Well, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm excited to talk about this stuff. So, um, right, I'm talking about extending homotopy type theory with linear type formers. And I had a look at some of the past talks for this uh, colloquium. And it seems like there's a fair bit of uh, general dependent type stuff, but not so much homotopy type theory. So I'm going to um, spend the first bit of the talk trying to like motivate why people care about homotopy type theory. Um, so for some people, this is might be boring review, uh, but hopefully this will get uh, other people up to speed. Okay, so homotopy type theory. What we're going to do is we're going to start with ordinary martin loft type theory. So we have dependent pairs, dependent functions, empty type, unit type, and then um, the uh, two more uh, two uh, maybe more interesting uh, type formers, uh, quality types and the universe. So um, hopefully everyone's familiar with dependent pairs and dependent functions uh, and empty types and unit types. Uh, I'm going to skip to talking about the last two. So equality types uh, let us reason about the equality of terms 
internally. So working inside the type theory, we can prove things about um, when terms are equal uh, rather than working externally and proving when terms are equal uh, like uh, meta-theoretically. So the rules for equality types are uh, the limb looks a bit intimidating, but the, the formation and intro are not so bad. So um, uh, to, to form an, identity, uh, an equality type, all we need is two terms of the same type. And then there's a new type, which is um, the, the type of equalities of those two uh, particular terms. And there's, a, um, there's one way to introduce a term of an equality type, which is just reflexivity. If you have a if you have a single term of a type, there's always the reflexive equality which equates that term with itself, right? So the limb is maybe more, more interesting. What this says is that if we if we're interested in some type C here, which depends on some uh, which depends on a generic equality, so uh, we don't know anything about the endpoints of this equality, and we can inhabit this C when that equality uh, when that equality happens to be reflexivity. Then, in fact, we can inhabit that um, that type when when the the equality that we choose is uh, any equality at all. So, as long as what we're proving is a, is a generic thing about a um, equality, it's enough to prove it for reflexivity, which is sort of magical, but it's it's what makes this whole thing work. Uh, okay, so what can we do with this? Well, the um, something we can do just with the tools that we've got so far is uh, describe when elements of a uh, pair type are, um, are equal. So if we have two elements of a pair type, if we've fixed like a, a and B and A prime and B prime, then the type of equalities between them is equivalent to, uh, well, we have an equality between the first component. And what we'd like to say is there's an equality between the second component, but because these uh, pairs are dependent, the second components don't have literally the same type. They're, they're off by the, um, the difference in the first component. So what we need to do is this B prime is a term of uh, the type B at A prime, so we need a function which takes us back to B at A. And we can build such a function using the, the path in the, uh, uh, using the path on the first component using the equality eliminator. Uh, like I'm not gonna go through all the details. The, the point is just that um, just with the tools that we have, uh, we can decompose uh, an equality between two pairs into like simpler things. Uh, so here I said that this type is equivalent to this type, and I really should say what I mean. What I mean is um, there's a function from one to the other that has a left inverse and a right inverse. So when you compose the, um, the function on the left by the left inverse, you get the identity. Uh, you pointwise get the identity function, um, again, up to this equality type. And if you have a right inverse that you compose on the right, then you, you that's also equal uh, pointwise equal to the identity. So I'm saying that there is a map from here to here um, with a left and right inverse. Um, okay, so that was that was dependent pairs. For dependent functions, with the tools that we have, we actually can't um, decompose a quality of functions into anything simpler. Um, uh, so it, it seems like we're kind of stuck, but there, there is a candidate for what such a decomposition might look like. Oh, hang on. oh, there we go. So if we have an equality between two dependent functions, there's something that we might like it to be equivalent to, which is um, uh, a pointwise equality of the functions. So if we have a function f and a function g and an equality between them, we can use equality elimination to build a pointwise um, uh, equality between them. So for every, uh, for every a, we can get a path from f at 
so for every x in A, we can get a path at f from f at x to g at x. So this thing on the right here is like a candidate, like simplification of what this um, uh, equality uh, could be. And then we can add an axiom to our theory saying, okay, this, this map here is actually an equivalence. So every equality between functions is given by uh, a point like pointwise equality between them. Okay, so that um, that's equality of functions. We still have one. Uh, we still have another interesting type formula to consider, um, which is the universe. So again, with the tools that we have, uh, we don't have anything interesting we can say about what equality in the universe means. So uh, if we have a type A is equal to a type B, then we can't decompose that into anything simpler. But again, there is a candidate for what a simplification might be. Um, just a couple of slides ago, I defined what, it, uh, what an equivalence was. And an equivalence of types certainly seems like a way of thinking of those types as being equal. And given a path from A to B, we can certainly build an equivalence from A to B, again, using equality induction, uh, equality elimination. So here, this A equivalent to B is a candidate for what um, A equals B could be the same as. And this is, um, this is the famous univalence axiom that was invented by Voyevodsky. Uh, he says, we should put in an axiom that says that this map is an equivalence. Every equality between types is given by an equivalence between those types. So <clears throat> what's interesting is that this, uh, it's, the, the argument is not obvious, but this axiom actually um, implies the previous one, the, the function extensionality one. Uh, so I've, I've tried to um, motivate this axiom and try to make it seem as, as reasonable as I possibly can, but it has some sort of unintuitive um, consequences. So for example, let's think about sets. So before we put in the univalence axiom, uh, the Martinov type theory with function extensionality, um, we can definitely interpret those types as sets. So in sets, uh, an equality type between two um, elements of a set is just, well, it's just a singleton if those elements are actually the same element and it's empty otherwise. So, um, you know, A is either actually the same element as A prime or it isn't. And we just, you know, our, the resulting set is uh, choose accordingly. Uh, and, uh, you know, a way to, if we wanna make sure our type theory acts the same way, one thing we could do is we could put in um, a principle called uniqueness of identity proofs. So we could say that, okay, whenever we have two, th two equalities between things, then those equalities are themselves equal. This is something which is definitely true for sets because you know um, there's only one there's only at most one element of um, the the set corresponding to the equality type, so definitely it's equal. Uh, any any two elements are equal, <clears throat> but we can't have this and univalence at the same time. So um, and the argument's not too it's not too hard to see why. So if we just think about the Booleans, which have, which have you know, true and false as elements, there are two equivalences uh, between the Booleans and themselves. We could take the identity, which does nothing, or we could just swap true and false. Univalence says that these uh, equivalences uh, can be turned into equalities from the type bool uh, to itself. Uniqueness of identity proof says that these equalities are actually themselves equal. So like running the univalence equivalence backwards tells us that the identity function is equal to the swap function, but then we, you know, we get this chain. True is equal to the identity on true, which is the same as swap on true because identity is equal to swap, which is equal to false, and then we're in trouble. Um, so we can't have both of these at the same time. And homotopy type theory, uh, comes from uh, the attitude that we should ditch uniqueness of identity proofs and go all in on univalence and 
see what interesting consequences it has. Yeah, and uh, this this proof uh, that you gave, you chose ID and swap, but I could have chose like ID and, and any other bijection that was different than than ID, I guess, and it would still work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, just so that they're different. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, cool. Um, okay, so if if it's no longer the case that all equalities between two things are equal to each other, then how should we be thinking about these things? Well, you know, this is the kind of picture which you always see in these kind of talks. I'm going to use the same thing. We should be thinking of these equalities as um, acting like paths in some kind of shape. So here, this diagram on the right is supposed to represent some type A, which has some sort of wonky shape. And uh, A and B are two terms of this type, the two points. And then we've got three, um, we've got three equalities between A and B, except if we're thinking of them as paths, uh, they could be uh, actually genuinely different paths between A and B. Um, so here we've got F, G, and K. But uh, there is some sense in which F and G here are more or less the same path. So we could start at F and then gradually change uh, F to continuously uh, squish it to become G. So in some sense, this kind of surface, this P surface here is saying that F and G aren't actually different. They're, they're the, um, these two equalities between A and B are the same. So, you know, because A equals B uh, is itself a type, we could, you know, draw a picture of the, the a shape corresponding to that type. And so this part of the, the diagram here means that, okay, well, we've got two paths F and G, um, which are themselves equal. So inside this type, um, there's an equality, there's a path between F and G. Um, so thinking of F and G now as points in this different type, right? And off to the side here, we have K, which uh, here, there's no way to, to like um, continuously change K so that it becomes equal to F and G. This K is a genuinely different path that doesn't have an equality to one of these. So it's sort of sitting off here in its own, um, own component. Okay. So this is sort of how we should be thinking about um, equality types once we um, commit to univalence. <laughs> okay, so to make sure that this interpretation actually means something, uh, it, was, it was proved, uh, originally I believe the argument was Voyevodsky's, but then it was written up by Chris Kapurkin and Peter Lumsdain. Um, uh, that this type theory, meaning Martin Loeff type theory plus univalence, plus something I didn't mention uh, called higher inductive types, which I'm, I'm not going to, which won't matter for the rest of the talk. Collectively, those three things are referred to as homotopy type theory. And there is an interpretation of these things in um, these objects called simplicial sets, which um, we can think of as um, like, you know, this kind of. Uh, space, this kind of shape. Uh, so they are, um, so they model the homotopy theory of spaces uh, and they, the homotopy of theory of these things is actually the same as the homotopy theory of topological spaces. Uh, but for um, technical reasons, the model is done in simplicial sets rather than in topological spaces themselves. But um, <clears throat> what's important here is that when we're dealing with them, it's it's probably best to think about these think think of our types as just ordinary sets with points, but where the equalities between the points might themselves be quite complicated. So um, it's you know to stay sane, it might be better to be thinking of these types just as uh, sets with equalities rather than spaces in general. Um, are uh, simplicial sets, uh, you were saying that 
you know, the model happens to be uh, equivalent to topological spaces. Is that true in general about some placial sets or is it just happen to be for, for the particular model for uh, homotopy type theory that that model is equivalent to a model in uh, topological spaces? So, so completely independently of type theory, um, uh, you can you could talk about um, different categories as presenting the same homotopy theory. Right. And yeah. independent of type theory, it's the case that both simplicial sets and topological spaces present the same homotopy theory. Okay, cool. Um, nice. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, right. Okay. So I can't help but repeat this observation, which I, I can't remember who it's due to originally, but often these sorts of sets with possibly complicated equalities are called, like in mathematics, they're called homotopy types. So um, there are sort of two, it's two cute ways to interpret the name homotopy type theory. You can think of it either as like a type theory with like homotopical features or a theory of homotopy types. And I think both are, um, you know, reasonable meanings of the title. Okay. So uh, why is all of this useful? Well, um, <clears throat> so it turns out that quite a lot of classical homotopy theory uh, can be done internally to type theory. And this has some benefits. Um, so, uh, first of all, because we're doing things in type theory, uh, we can use a proof assistant and have them actually check that our arguments are formally correct, which is pretty cool. Um, there are not many of fields of mathematics which have that privilege at the moment. But also, um, homotopy type theory has many models. And if you prove your result um, uh, in type theory, then it should also apply in all of the models uh, without having to, um, you know, rerun the argument uh, manually in each one, uh, which is a win because, uh, you know, some models are extremely complicated and having this, this tool to reason about them can be very um, time-saving. So here, what I've got is a table of, you know, on the left here, there are the original classical homotopy theory results. And then the date that they were originally proved and on the right, these are, these are the authors that um, actually uh, devised the, the synthetic proof of the, the same result. So uh, this was all in the last few years because of course, homotopy theory, uh, type theory has only been around for the last um, 10 years or so. Uh, but what I'd like to point out is that we're slowly creeping up on the present day. We're slowly making more progress. Um, uh, uh, in, Proving the, uh, getting these results uh, proven and formalized, which is really cool. Okay, so that's the end of my intro to hot, I think. Yeah, sorry, I had another question. Sorry, I yeah, asking sure. Questions, but you're bringing up interesting things. So, uh, so you're saying, you know, we can think of, you know, if you prove a result in homotopy type theory, then, you know, essentially, you're sort of proving it at an abstract level enough to where it's going to hold in like every model that that we want. Um, right. If you want it to be more specific, though, so, I mean, because there's some problems that you want to prove hold in like maybe a subset of the models or one. I guess uh, has there been any results where they needed to do that, where they like get added axioms to like windle down the models that they actually wanted to hold in to be more specific, or is right. it generally uh, we're just looking at what holds in all of them? Well, that's something that you can certainly do. Um, so, and, and one way to do that is, um, you know, s s say in your type theory, you could, you could just assert that some axiom holds and then prove the thing that you want to. Um, and then later you could go and check whether that axiom works, like which models that axiom works in, right? Right. Definitely. So um, that's, that's certainly something you can do. Um, uh, for example, you know, you know, there are some useful things which hold for simplicial sets specifically, which don't hold in general. So if, for, mm -hmm. for example, the law of excluded middle um, does hold in simplicial sets. So you can 
have both univalence and the law of excluded middle. But um, I, I believe that most models don't have that. So you really are cutting down on your options when you, when you make that choice. Right, yeah, okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Right. But, but that does lead into uh, like what, what I'm gonna uh, move on to, which is often you have these models, uh, you have these actual mathematical objects, which sure they're a model of hot, but there's, there, there are more things about them which you um, would you like to talk about in type theory. Um, uh, and so you would like to extend type theory with more operations that correspond to the, um, the, uh, the operations that exist in the model. So uh, that brings us to modal homotopy type theory. And so the first example of this uh, was uh, uh, the first ver modal version of homotopy type theory was devised by Mike Schulman, who uh, came up with an extension of type theory, which he used to prove a synthetic version of Brouwer's fixed point theorem. So I'll tell you what that is in a second. So the um, that's not to say that he invented this thing just so he could show Brouwer's fixed point theorem. Uh, this wasn't his like ultimate goal. It was just that this was a cool test case for this theory which he'd come up with, right? Um, okay, so here's, here's what the, pro the, the, the problem is. So Brouwer's fixed point theorem is a theorem from classical topology, which says that uh, if we have the unit disc uh, as represented by this outer circle, and we have a continuous map from the unit disk to itself. So we've squished it up and, and um, mapped it into itself in some way, um, you know, continuously. Then somewhere there's a fixed point. There's a point on the disk that didn't move under this mapping, right? Uh, but um, if we're thinking of our types as being, uh, as having some sort of shape, then um, up, up to equality, uh, a, a disc in, in that sense is the same thing as a point. Because what we could do is we could continuously shrink a disc uh, down into the, its center, for example, and uh, define an equivalence that way. So the problem with trying to do an argument like this in homotopy type theory, is that everything you do in homotopy type theory is automatically homotopy invariant. And uh, after homotopy, the disk is equivalent to the unit type, but then the theorem doesn't mean anything. The theorem is pointless because of course, any map from the unit type to itself has a fixed point. So um, we didn't really learn anything. Okay. Uh, so what we need is a way to talk about stuff like the unit disk in type theory in a way which doesn't um, uh, make it trivial. So what we need to do is, uh, ooh, is this covering the text? Can you see that? We can't see the text. Oh, that's a pain. Maybe I'll stop moving the mouse and it'll go away. Um, right, so we need a, a, a way of thinking about uh, the disk as a space with points that are distinct from each other. Um, but still somehow remember that they're, they're arranged in a shape. Um, okay, so this is what the, the modal extension of homotopy type theory tends to do. Uh, okay, so rather than thinking of types as sets with complicated equality, uh, the idea is to think of them as sets with complicated equality and uh, a topology on them. So the equality where we're gonna use is some sort, you know, uh, as like a, a logical thing. And the topology is gonna to be describing like the shape of the, the disc. Um, and, and these things are sort of like independent axes along which a, um, a type might have information. So let me, let me give you an example. Uh, so a, a t any given type might have trivial, like you know, boring equalities or interesting equalities, and it might have a uh, boring topology and interesting topology. So for example, the unit type is uh, like everything in the unit type is equal to, there's only one element of the unit type and there's no interesting topology on the unit type. It's just a, a point. Um, 
And similarly for the natural numbers, it's just a discrete set of like n points which are unrelated to each other. And a number is only equal to itself. There's no interesting equality going on there. Uh, but so our, our disk and its, its boundary, the, so like the, um, the circle, they also have trivial equality because every point in, in the disk and every point on the circle is only equal to itself. It's not equal to any other point, but it has interesting topology because the disk, you know, we're remembering the way it's actually arranged in the plane and similarly for the circle. And just as an, as an example of a um, type with both interesting equality and topology, the universe has, has you know, has both sort of because, I mean, in some sense, it has to contain all types. So it has to contain all the um, uh, interesting features of all of them. I, that's stupid reasoning, but like, uh, that's, that's what I'm thinking of. And I think it makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so now um, we wanna add stuff, we wanna add uh, type formers to type theory, which let us talk about this topological information. So what happens in cohesive type theory is um, there are three new unary type formers. Uh, first of all, this sharp uh, forgets the topological information on a type and gives it the co-discrete topology. Flat forgets the topo topological information of A and gives it the discrete topology. What's the co-discrete topology? Um, so co-discrete sort of means like everything is everything is glued together in one big lump. Um, it's like the opposite of discrete, where everything is is set as a as a distinct point. Yeah. But then uh, the 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 important one here is the last one, which um, which relates the, um, the topolo topological information to the uh, equality information. So it turns topological paths in the space into like equalities in the sense of like type theory equalities. So going back to the table, um, well, the ones that I've added are, are here and here. So here, our disk starts with interesting topology, but then when we turn all of the paths into the disk into equalities, the entire disk becomes equal and just is becomes the point. So, you know, the, 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 this, um, this, this shape of disk um, type is actually equivalent to the, the unit type. The same thing doesn't happen for um, the circle because different paths, uh, because there are genuinely different paths from a point on the circle to itself. We could take the path that doesn't go anywhere on the circle. We could take the path that goes around the circle once or twice or however many times you like. And each of those paths becomes an equality of that point to itself. Um, so our, um, the shape of the circle has interesting equality. And uh, this difference is basically what you need to run the, the ordinary argument for um, Brouwer's fixed point theorem. So this is just if you happen to have seen the argument before but you can, you can define a map from the disk to the circle. Um, so if you, if you assume you have a map with no fixed points, you can define a retraction from the disk to the circle. And then the fact that this one is trivial, but this one is not, um, gives you a contradiction. Um, you, that's just- Can you explain why um, that one is trivial? The one, what, the one where your cursor, that one, can you explain this why one? that one is trivial? Because I don't see that from the informal explanation you gave for the other one. Right, okay, so the, um, in the disk, any, any path that you draw from, um, say, say you, you fix a point, you, you pick a point and you draw a path from that point to itself, then you know, it might squiggle all over the disk or something like that. But in some sense, because the disk is kind of filled in, we can, kind of, we can shrink that path down to a point and, it, and that path actually was not, um, uh, interesting at all. And can you the difference, yeah. the difference with the circle is that because the inside of the circle is not filled in, when you go around the the, the outside, when you go around the circle, um, there's no way to make that path 
trivial. You're kind of stuck going around the circle. If okay, that makes so sense. It's sort of about um, like de deformations in algebraic topology. Yes, yes, that's the yeah. idea. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, right. So just uh, very roughly the way that this works, we're gonna focus on the flat um, uh, modality because that's the one which is most similar to what I'm gonna show you in a second. <clears throat> the idea is um, if we want to add this flat thing as a type former, we're going to add a version of it which applies to the context and then um, add a type former which internalizes this context operation. So for the intro, what we're gonna do is like, if we've got any term of type A, then we can use that uh, in context gamma, we can use that to get a term in context F gamma of flat A. And this is just like a functoriality sort of thing. So we're applying the context version to the context and the type version to the type. And that's how we, that's how we get a, a term of flat type. And the flat a limb is kind of similar to the, um, the, uh, a quality a limb in the sense that if we're trying to prove something using uh, that, that depends on a term of flat type, then the way we can do it is we assume we have like a generic element of the, um, the flat type. So like an element which comes just from F applied to a, um, a variable. And if we can prove it for a generic element, then in fact, it works for any actual element of flat, um, flat type. So if you squint your eyes, this looks uh, just like the um, equality elimination rule, except anywhere that we've, met, uh, we've, we've replaced this stuff in the context with um, flats. Um, so this, this kind of structure is very similar to the, the box modality, which uh, was in the, the Fenning and Davies paper, where he talks, they talk about a judgmental reconstruction of modal logic. And it's also similar to the, the, the bang um, modality in dual, uh, this, this theory called dual intuitionistic linear logic. Uh, and in both of them, the, the pattern is we, we add a version of the thing we care about to the context and then relate the type to the context version. Okay. So does, does that mean it has a, a kind of substructural flavor as well? Like it has a kind of contractive and weakening maps in the context? Oh, yes, yeah, yes, sorry, I should have said. So you, um, in, in, in Mike's theory, the, this isn't what the rule literally looks like. Uh, it builds in, it does build in a bunch of structural rules after, after this to make various things admissible so that yes, weakening and contraction. Yeah and um, all that become admissible. Yes. Okay, I just wanted to check what was included in the extremely roughly. <laughs> yes, sorry, <laughs> it was really extremely no. roughly, yes. No, that was fine, yeah, okay, okay, thanks. Sorry about that. Um, no worries. Okay. So what we've just done talking about um, uh, cohesive type theory is gonna be sort of our plan for talking about the, these linear operators as well. We're going to first think of a model of uh, homotopy type theory with more structure than bare homotopy types. In the um, cohesive case, it was we had this extra topological structure going on. Then we're going to add some, um, we're going to identify some things you can do in the semantics, which we want to be able to do in the type theory and add a version of that that works on the context. And then we're going to add new type formers that internalize this extra context structure which we've just put in. And if we do things right, we'll end up with, a, with an extension of homotopic type theory um, so, so that we still are able to use all of the synthetic, uh, uh, all of the results proved in homotopy type theory already. Um, all of those things should still hold in our extended type theory, which is a, a big leg up in trying to get stuff done. Uh, Okay, so uh, now we get to the stuff that we've been working on. Uh, so the first step is to, I, I'm gonna try and explain what the semantic situation is, which is sort of our motivation for this whole thing. Um, 
which is we'd like to be able to talk about stable homotopy theory. So um, stable homotopy theory is uh, a huge part of how um, uh, homotopy theory is done these days. And just to give a, a very quick sense of what it's about, um, there's this extremely important tool in homotopy theory called um, cohomology. And the idea is that whenever you have some space that you're interested in, you can extract from that space a sequence of groups that, that tell you stuff about the space. In particular, um, they can tell you whether spaces are different. They can tell you features about um, uh, what kind of constructions you can do on the space. Uh, they have a lot of information. In this H here, there are many different kinds of cohomology which people care about, um, you know, depending on the setting. And each kind of cohomology, uh, the data of one of these cohomology theories can be packed into a um, this, this like convenient object called a spectrum. So uh, it turns out that the, a spectrum is quite like uh, an abelian group. So if you like, you could, we could just think about abelian groups um, for, the, for the rest of the talk and we'll be fine. But um, <clears throat> very quickly, you can, you can define what a spectrum is uh, in type theory pretty easily. So a spectrum is a sequence of pointed types together with an equivalence between each type and um, uh, loops on the next type. So this, um, uh, this omega here is just, well, we've got some base point and we're looking at uh, qualities from that base point to itself. And this is sort of, a, I mean, this is a weird thing to think about, but it turns out to be the same as uh, spectra that homotopy theorists care about. And uh, if you fiddle with things, it turns out that this is sort of uh, um, quite similar to uh, making E0, the base space of the sequence, uh, like, like an abelian group, but somehow like an extremely abelian group, like you know, it's commutative and the commutativity is commutative and um, there's like an infinite tower of coherences. Um, but anyway, like this definition isn't, uh, isn't actually gonna matter for the rest of the talk. I just thought I should say what the, the objects that we care about. So um, we wanna be able to talk about these things using type theory. And there are uh, a couple of options. So first of all, the definition that I just gave here, um, this is basically, a, this is a type theoretic definition of a spectrum. So what we could do is we could just take that definition and run with it in type theory and try to prove things about spectra. But the problem is that that's very difficult because each spectrum has so much information in it, uh, just because we have, um, uh, we have this infinite sequence of types and um, we have to, uh, prove a whole sequence of equivalences about them and um, maps between such things have a whole bunch of complicated, uh, have, have like a whole sequence of commutative squares and it just gets very uh, complicated very quickly. And there hasn't been a whole lot of work done on spectra and type theory for, as far as I can tell, this reason that it just gets really hairy, really fast. So another option is we could try and uh, use a type theory which has a model in spectra. So the uh, spectra have a bunch of structure on them. They have a, like a tensor and a, a linear implication and they have like the uh, a version of with and um, sum and this curious coincidence that those happen to be the same thing. Uh, but compared with homotopy type theory, this isn't a lot to work with. Like we don't have, um, we don't have dependent functions. We don't have equal, uh, We don't have universes. Uh, we basically can't get off the ground doing any of the synthetic stuff just with this um, uh, this structure. So here's what we're going to do instead. Instead, we're going to think about spectra as lying in a bigger category, and the objects that we're going to look at are these things called parameterized spectra. So a parameterized spectrum is like, a, oh, sorry, I shouldn't have said this. I should have said like simplicial set. So it's like a, um, it's a 
it's a pushel set indexed family of spectra. Or, you know, to try and translate this into something more comprehensible, it's like a set with a quality so that every element of that set with a quality has an associated abelian group with a quality sort of thing. So the picture which I always draw for things is sort of like, uh, draw for these things is like this. So in the base, we've got some um, indexing uh, set. And then every point of that indexing set has an associated abelian group like thing living over it. And uh, so some, what's nice about this, uh, this category is that, well, it, it includes just the indexing objects because we can put like a, a trivial, we can put the zero abelian group over every um, element of the indexing uh, set. But we can also talk about just the, an abelian group by itself by setting the indexing set to just be the point and then putting whatever specific um, abelian group thing we care about as the unique thing over that point. Right. Sort of the miraculous fact is that this um, uh, category of parameter spectra uh, is a model of homotopy type theory. So, We've got an interpretation of Martinov type theory and univalence, and the higher inductive types um, th that I mentioned earlier in the talk are, are works in progress, but pe people think that it can be done. So I'm, we're just going to run with it and say that we can do, um, we can interpret all of hot into this um, category. Okay. So the next step is what, um, what structure is there in this category? which we can try and add to the type theory. So this is where the linear types come in. So for any two of these objects, there should be a type, like a linear type that, uh, that does the following calculation. So in the base uh, of the result, we're gonna take the, the ordinary Cartesian product of the, the bases of the two input things. And then as the, uh, over every pair, in the indexing, indexing set over here, we look at the corresponding abelian group things uh, over our input, and we take the tensor product of um, abelian groups, and that will be the, um, the, uh, the new abelian group over the, the, that pair in the base. So this, uh, there are no structural rules for this operation. There's no weakening or contraction. And um, so it really does act like a, the tensor from linear logic. Okay. So <clears throat> the next step is uh, we have to add a context version of this operation. So we're gonna do something uh, similar to what has been studied before in these things called bunched logics, where there are two ways of combining contexts. Uh, we have sort of a, the ordinary Cartesian comma, and then this extra linear one, which corresponds to this operation. And I've just, uh, I mean, to keep it like really visually distinct from this, I've been writing it in these sort of bubbles. So we've got bubbles like this, that's saying, okay, we're tensoring these two pieces of the context together. So the comma, like, uh, in ordinary type theory, we've got weakening and, weakening and contraction over here, but no structural rules for these guys. And um, I'm also just completely ignoring dependence for now. Um, <clears throat> okay. So in general, because these things can be like combined in arbitrary ways, our, our contexts are no longer like flat lists of variables. Rather, they have this um, tree structure where the... Um, the Cartesian product and the tensor product can sort of alternate as we go down the tree. So I've written the same context in two different ways here. So at the top level, we've got X and W sort of, you know, uh, Cartesian product with this whole chunk in the middle, which is itself like a tensor of this bit and this bit. So we've got the Y over here. And now uh, this, these three correspond to these bottom three. So this, this bit here is common together. So we know that's a Cartesian product. And then finally, this is a tensor product together. So we've got a tensor product here, right? So a problem like this is that it gets really hard to follow what's going on really fast. So the first thing I'm going to um, 
do is give us a, a different notation for talking about the same thing. Um, and so here's, here's what I've come up with for this. Um, we're gonna track the shape of the context. So the tree shape of how we're arranging all the tenses separately in this thing on the left here, which I've been calling a palette, like a color palette. And on the right, it is gonna be the list of variables and their types together with a little annotation telling us where in the tree the, um, that variable is supposed to go. So in this case, this, this palette over here is telling us that, oh, I'm gonna stop moving the mouse so that goes away. Um, that palette on its own is telling us that the tree um, shape that this context uses looks like this. So uh, we always have variables which might be at the top level of the tree. And so, I mean, we're, we're gonna give that a special name. And uh, so there are gonna be some variables of that top color, but there's also a tensor product of two subcolors, the R and the B, which themselves can contain a bunch of variables um, Cartesian producted together. So this is quite a, a sorry, go ahead. I'm confused. Um, I don't see W and I don't understand what W top is doing. Uh, you don't see W? I don't so, see it in below. Oh, right, right, right. Um, so uh, sure, I'm, th I'm thinking of these labels here as locations um, telling us where to put things. So the, um, the fact that X is given this label R tells us that it's gonna be put, uh, I wish, can I move this? I can't move that. Um, it's gonna be put down here within the red variable section. Yeah. The B is telling us the Y is gonna be put down here. And these tops tell us that both Z, Z and W are gonna be put in the, the top level of the context in this section. And it does correspond to the original context we've got up here where, where Z and W are both at the top level of the context, not contained inside any, um, any, any tensor product. Okay, now I'm oh, sorry, I have a follow-up. So why sure. do you have bars going off as a right subtree? And why is that somehow the top level? I, I, just, don't, I just don't know what your, your um, uppercase, your top is supposed to be representing. So I'm sorry. Sure. <laughs> No, no, no. Um, uh, so, yes, that's why I didn't explain this very well, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> why the, didn't very well? <laughs> the, uh, let, me, let me try again. So the, I, I think like the, the top notation is just kind of arbitrary. I mean, these are just arbitrary symbols you chose, like top meaning yeah. the, the top of the tree. And I, I'm not concerned about the symbol. I understand that like the R and the B, those are some, those are some colors in your palette. And you're saying that X is in the R part and Y is in the B part. But I don't understand, right. why is there a top thing? And why is that a special designation? Right. Oh. Right, right, right. Okay, yeah. So, so the idea is that um, just sort of for for slightly annoying reasons that I uh, I can get into later. It's it's a bit of a pain to give the top level of the context its own name. Um, so uh, I'm going to fix the convention that whenever um, whenever we write the the top symbol, I'm referring to the 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 top level of the context. Um, so is that like even tensor it's all kind of like if you were to write out the all the tensors it would be like the unit for the tensor or something no 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 so the um so it's saying that the um the the eventual meaning of this context is um like a tensor with b um product with c product with d is sort of how we should be thinking about it and the the fact that um uh, this stuff is is placed in the uh, so, so the all the variables of the top color as pl are placed as children of the topmost uh, Cartesian product node. Um, so uh, I'm just I'm I'm going to set that there's a special symbol that means that um, these variables are in the topmost Cartesian product. Okay, I'm not okay. sure if that helps. Um, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> Thank well, you. Well, we'll try to, you know, right. The problem with this formalism is that the um, actually using it is much easier than trying to write the um, the, the rules for it. But um, right. Well, thank, thanks a lot. <laughs>
Sure, we can come back to it at the end. Uh, or maybe another example will help. I had one question as well, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think your explanation was trying to tell us that it's kind of easier technically for some technical reasons to leave like top level implicit, I guess, like in, right. your, in your notation. But one thing right. I, was, I was wondering as well is that for, for R and B, it looks like every branch is like, uh, they're all, like if I have like, you know, here we have, so I'm supposed to have two reds, like X and X and uh, X prime are both red then th th those would be products together. Could I get a, is there no way to do like tensor tensor, I guess? Right, yes. So I've got, I've got an example of this on the next slide. So let me, let's have a look. Oh, okay, sorry. Right, okay. Yeah, so th definitely we can nest tensors more deeply than that. Um, and so that's, that's what they're gonna add to the palette notation to let us do that. So we've got some, this is the, the context from um, a few slides ago. This is the same one where we've sort of had this more deeply nested tensor. And the idea is the palette over here is going to tell us that, okay, um, we've got a split of like uh, R tensored with all of this stuff. And uh, so G is going to be the name for the, the, all the stuff on this side. So we're splitting stuff into uh, like red and green and green itself splits into um, blue and yellow. So th this symbol apparently is a fractal Y um, if you believe that. Um, right. So yes, we can certainly have nested tenses um, uh, in general. Oh, this thing's annoying. Um, and we sort of extend our palette notation to allow each color to be further divided into subcolors. So here again, um, of each variable is annotated with uh, the label, which tells you where it goes in the tree. So for example, the Z here is um, given the color green because it's, um, it's not all the way nested deeply inside the, the most innermost tensor, rather it's in the, 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 um, the Cartesian product node, uh, which is right next to the red one. So um, uh, if you, uh, right. If you, if you arrange all of these variables sort of uh, in the tree, the way, uh, as they are labeled, we, we will get back to this, um, context at the top. Um, right, okay. So uh, let me, like, I, I can see that I'm running out of time uh, and that's, that's on me, uh, but let me try and show you how this looks to use because that's sort of the most important thing. Okay. So again, ignore dependency. We're just gonna say that whenever we've got two types, two closed types where um, we could take that tense product. Um, and, uh, Sorry, these slides should have been switched. Uh, the, the variable rule uh, only lets us use a variable if it has the top color. And the, the idea of that is it's only if the variable has the top color that it's sitting inside a Cartesian product node at the top, in which case we can project it out. If we've got some general variable which is sitting deep inside a tensor, there's no reason that we should be able to project out and access that variable. Um, okay, so, right. Only use variables of the top color. Uh, we can form a tensor when we've got two closed types. Closed types. Now, uh, our intro rule is just like the rule for um, linear logic. It's very similar in that if we want to prove a tense B, then we look at the palette and split it into two disjoint pieces, and then use one piece to prove A and one piece to prove B. So that should be very familiar from linear logic. Um, uh, and sort of the reason I'm using this color notation is that it can make it really obvious when a term that you've written is actually valid or not. Because uh, if you've got a valid split of the palette into two pieces, then all of your red variables can only be used on one side of the tensor and all of your blue variables can only be used on the other side of the tensor. Otherwise, you didn't actually divide your, your resources up correctly. Um, right. 
Okay. The limb rule follows the pattern that we've seen a couple of times now, which is that if we're trying to prove something that depends on a tensor product, and we can show that it's true for the generic tensor product, then it's true for any, um, any value of the tensor product. So here, what we're saying is, uh, we're trying to prove something about uh, you uh, depending on z, uh, z. And uh, let's suppose that z is in fact x tensor y, where x and y are given these like fresh colors from the palette. So we're going to add two new colors to the palette that are tensored together, and then um, uh, immediately assign x to red and y to blue, and then um, our generic tensor is this x tensor y thing. Um, and if we can prove C in this case, then in fact, it works for any, um, any tensor. Oh, this should be an S, but yes, it works for any tensor S. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let's just start doing some examples of how this works. So first of all, the simplest thing we could possibly do is, is swap two sides of the tensor. So um, if we've got some tensor, we can assume that it's, uh, uh, some generic tensor x tensor y uh, for fresh variables x and y. And then we can certainly form y tensor x and take that as our result. So um, we can define our swap function like this. And something that's sort of interesting is that this, this arrow here is the ordinary function type. This isn't the, the linear um, home type that you might expect if you've um, thought about uh, linear logic. Uh, so there is something actually like non-trivial and non-trivially uh, interesting and bunchy going on. And I'll try and demonstrate that. So whenever we have access to some variables from the context, like they have the, they have the correct uh, colors, we can do whatever sort of homotopy type theory stuff that we like to them. So for example, we could come up with a map from A tensor B to like A cross A tensor B. Because, uh, well, we take our tensor, split it into two pieces. And then when we're forming the left side of this tensor here, we have access to our, our red X and we can do whatever we like with it. We can copy it, we can drop it, we can apply you know, functions to it. Inside the left side of this tensor here, it behaves just like an ordinary um, variable. So in, in particular, you could do like, all kinds of weird stuff. Like we could take a we could take a function from A tensor B into the universe tensor itself by taking um, taking a pair, splitting it to pieces, and then looking at equalities of that uh, each um, uh, each uh, term with itself. Uh, my point is just that inside here we can do ordinary hot stuff. Right. So. Um, uh, as a final example of like how this can sort of be um, bunched and interesting, say we've just got some function hanging around which goes from C tensor C to um, the natural numbers. Well, say we split this up. Well, we can, um, we can apply this function to the P that we started with. We haven't consumed P at all by doing this split. Um, and we can also apply the same function again to the tensor swapped around. So all of the linearity happens in the choice that, the choices that we make when we go under a tensor intro. Um, other than that, we can use any variables that we have as much as we like. So it's sort of a, um, perhaps a, a different sort of, um, linearity to what, um, you might be used to. Okay. <clears throat> so just to, um, oh, I, I've already said this, but um, this, this color syntax makes it very easy to tell when something is not well-formed. Um, so for example, we know that if we've got some A, we can't form like A tense A because um, we can't use the same colored variable twice on both sides. Uh, and the, the colors are like an immediate way to say that there's no valid split of the palette, which lets us do this. And um, so this is sort of why contraction is not uh, allowed. 
but also like um, a projection is not allowed. We can't define something like this where we take two sides of a tensor and then use them simultaneously in general. If this was a product, we would know how to do this because you can just apply the function here to the argument A. But here, if we split this tensor into an X, uh, into two, two sides, um, an X and an F, we can't form this thing here because neither of these variables have the top color because they've been assigned um, fresh colors that are tensored together. Neither of them are usable right now. And sort of, again, uh, just visually using the colors, it's obvious that this is not going to be well formed. There's like a color clash kind of thing going on, which, which I think is just a neat uh, way of thinking about things. Um, right. So um, I see that I'm almost out of time. So I'm just going to zoom through this. Um, the interesting thing to think about now is the way dependency is supposed to work because um, uh, there's a problem with dependency if in the intro rule, when we restrict our palettes into two sub palettes, we start dropping variables from the context because then we get into trouble because what if something depends on something earlier that we've just dropped, um, like how are things supposed to make sense anymore? Um, so we're sort of saved by the way the, uh, by um, inspecting the way the, the semantics and parameterized spectra work. So the, this kind of um, tensor product, this kind of dependent tensor product only makes sense when the, um, the second component only varies over the, like the underlying indexing set of the first one. So this is like a, a semantic expl explanation, which isn't very helpful, but you can, we can um, uh, try and enforce this kind of condition syntactically. Um, I'll skip that. Okay, so uh, to make this work, what we do is we add a special variable rule which says um, we're going to use this variable, but we're only going to use the underlying set of it, and we're going to ignore all of the um, the abelian group stuff, right? And the idea is that this variable is going to be able be allowed to be used at uh, at any point, even if the corresponding thing in the context doesn't have the top color. So it's sort of like in a, um, uh, this, is, this is quite similar to like a zero use variable sort of thing, which, which shows up in um, other uh, dependent type theories that track resources. So in uh, the tensor formation rule, um, if we're gonna form a tensor type, we're gonna allow access to the variables in the context but only via this special underlined rule. We're going to completely obliterate any of the, the palette and color stuff in the context and just use everything using the, um, this sort of monochrome um, variable rule. Right. And then this saves us when we do those splitting rules because rather than dropping variables, um, we can keep them around, but just force them to only be used marked. So here we've got an example of uh, the tensor intro rule where we've divided our resources into the red side and the blue side. And uh, if we had to drop variables, then over here we would kind of be hosed because we would drop the X and then this B applied to X thing here doesn't make any sense anymore. But um, because we keep everything around marked, this type is still going to be well-formed because we could still use the, the, um, the underlying stuff. Uh, underlying part of X, right? Uh, and the last thing I'll say is that even this works very nicely with the, the color stuff because um, we're, we're using a, a blue variable here and sure it has some contribution from the variable X, but only sort of like a monochrome contribution that doesn't, doesn't count for, for using the, the red resource. Um, so, uh, right, there are, there are a bunch of other people who have also thought about linear dependent type theories, but I won't go through this list. I'll just say that um, the, your colloquium organizer and uh, Dominic Orchard have been working on a framework for dependent modal theories, and I'm looking forward to chatting with them and finding out whether somehow there's a way to encode this kind of stuff in the work that they've been doing.
Um, yeah, I was already thinking about that <laughs> the whole time you're logging. So. Right. Um, right, and that's the end. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. That was great. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, and I learned a lot, so that's even a bonus. <laughs> uh, does anybody have any questions uh, before we adjourn? Or? Um, I have questions, but um, maybe other people, mine are a little bit uh, off the off topic a little bit. So maybe other people have directly related questions first. I, I say go for it, Patty. It's fine. There's, there's no uh, restrictions on questions. <laughs> okay. So, um, I think it's my, maybe my overly algebraic brain, <laughs> but on your, you have that slide about palettes. And uh, uh, this one? Uh, uh, yeah, that one, the one I kept asking about. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I'm just curious. I mean, um, does it matter? Like, is the unit for the um, times and tensor the same? And is that important here? Uh, right, so they are not the same, and that's uh, it turns out to be extremely important. The um, unit isn't the same. Yes, so the the um, the monoidal unit for mm -hmm. the the tensor is mm -hmm. is not the the point. It's not uh, one. It's not the unit type. Sorry. Okay, and that's uh, it's, sorry. The, the the naming's terrible. It's not the terminal object. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. And that and that is important. Yes. Yes. Because. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> if, it, if it was, if it was the terminal object, then you would always be able to uh, use a variable essentially by projecting everything to the oh, terminal object and then using the unitors to like clear everything away. Okay. Um, and we are, we are definitely not allowed to do that in this case. So the, um, the, uh, I didn't talk about it at all, but the, we also have rules for like a, a linear home and the, and the, um, the monoidal unit. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, th that's especially important because in stable homotopy theory, the monoidal unit is this thing called the sphere spectrum, which turns out to be like absolutely essential for the whole theory. So we do need a, a good uh, story for that in this type theory as well. Yeah. Okay, thanks, thanks a lot. I have a sort of perhaps slightly vague questions, apologies. Um, sure. So you, you were talking about structural rules and uh, it's kind of clear that you wanted to avoid contraction and weakening, but allow exchange. Mm -hmm. But then by kind of having this tree-like structure, it seems like you're avoiding the associativity structural rule um, because you're, because you're, you, your um, your information that's in this like side context is kind of telling you about the shape of this this kind of tree like thing. So that that seems like you're being sensitive to associate. You're saying there's no associativity essentially. Uh, is that right? Uh, right, that is true. The that's the palettes I suppose. the palettes do fix. Uh, they do refer to a specific associativity of um, of everything. Uh, but we, we certainly want to be able to reassociate things when we're using the, the theory. And that happens sort of in this, this sentence here, which is sort of skipping all of the detail. When we say that the palette splits into two pieces, this, uh, we're, we're also going to allow ourselves to reassociate things in that process. Um, uh, this okay. is sort of like a, a canonical spot to do that reassociating. So is, is another way of me, or, okay, so one way that I might put my sort of graded hat on is to sort of try and reorient this rule and say, oh, what I really want to do is take two contexts and have this additive operation in the conclusion that sort of mm -hmm. applies contraction, sort of adds up the grades and, and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I guess maybe this means it's sort of more like non-deterministic uh, because there's lots of choices for how you would do that depending on different associate associations. Like there's lots of ways to split, maybe, is another way of saying that. Um, I mean, hmm? could you get yourself into trouble with, like, I mean, say you're trying to prove something and you... Um, I mean, at that point, you must, you must have to allow yourself to reassociate 
somehow otherwise you would get stuck then when you want to um hmm. yeah i mean not having associativity is pretty hard i think harley's yes. the, the master of this he yeah, knows yeah, more yeah. about these non-associative logics than i do i see yeah it's a bit harder and then i see what uh, Mitchell is saying about this and I think in, in, in ordinary bunch logic they kind of do this similar thing but they use like this like whole syntax sort of like you know if you have this part of the tree um, then you so like here it'd be like phi of you know phi sub l comma or, or tensor phi sub r and you'd be able to kind of do this and that, that's where the associativity comes in there too it's kind of like but what you're saying Dom is I think it's kind of similar it's like you know we're able to only you know, this phi has to be calculated in a way that it is split based on some associativity of like tensor stuff. And so I, I think the additive thing is, is pretty similar. It's pretty similar to what you're saying. So it's a bit more of a high level version of what I'm thinking about then is what I missed was why it was important to know about that, um, that sort of shape, the exact shape of the things rather than just sort of linear, non-linear kind of counting style like I know this is linear I know this is non-linear yeah what, what was that it, what was also, the use for that yeah that's also a question I was going to ask the the, the same thing because I was wondering where because it also one of your slides you're like oh you know the linear tensor doesn't have contraction but in bunch logic we, we don't really talk about uh you know counting right it's about there's actually a sharing that happens and sometimes you can use a, a contraction or a weakening for something that's being shared um that's why the like the linear hom is is a different syntax it's not like the lolly it's like the little it's the magic wand because we can actually do some some contractions with it uh in different spots i was wondering does that show up here at all or or is this more restricted than general bunch logic maybe um i'm trying to remember i think in um it, it depends on which uh bunched logic paper you're reading some of some of them um some of them very quickly add the assumption that the units are both the terminal object, um, in yeah, which yeah. case you are, you know you automatically have. Uh, yeah, so I'm referring to the original one. I don't think did that right. It was uh, it's, it's, um, like the the prim and uh, right, but they still order. didn't have contraction for the the. Um, yeah, not in general, but the there were cases where it would work. There, there, I mean, they give some examples in, in their papers that, and that's why they argue about the sharing interpretation versus the uh, like uh, resource use interpretation. It's quite surprising that. Uh, I'll have to have a look at another look again. Yeah, I'm afraid. I, I can have to remember that. I'm sorry. Maybe, yeah. that I'm to. maybe there's something yeah. that I'm not remembering about. It's been a while since I've read it, so I'll send it to right. you and see what you can. Sure. Um, Dom, I yeah, think you were saying something else, but I don't remember what it was. Um, uh, I think I was just yeah, I wanted to know a bit more about the importance of knowing the associative structure. Like, what does that give you? Um, well, it's the, the uh, so I, I spent quite a while um, working on a version of this palette stuff where um, uh, the, the palettes were associative sort of up to like, they were like definitionally associative. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, I, think, I think that just made things harder because you have to show that any palette operation that you do is like invariant under any sort of like reordering and, um, you know, associativity you might choose. And mm -hmm. it turned, as far as I can tell, it's actually not necessary to um, to to have the palettes be definitionally associative um, everywhere. If you can always push um, like an associativity switch uh, into a, a canonical place, which I believe you can, it's in this it's in this uh, tensor intro rule. It's like the only place where it where it absolutely has to happen. Hmm. Um, and otherwise, I think it saves a bunch of like meta theoretic effort to just leave it out as far as I can tell. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's a good reason. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm trying to think about how much uh, we, what, what our experiences with that exactly are, because. It's quite a lot, right? I mean, if you like look at our, 
the substitution for this half the time. There's like big strings of reorienting and then adding and then reorienting back. But we, but we do get a lot for free by having the structure of our contexts and like grades of vectors and things be sort of associative on the nose already. So, yeah, uh, I think that's how we deal with that kind of thing. So I guess I guess my thinking was, oh, to link this to something like a graded type system, uh, we don't have an explicit representation of associativity. Like the grades tell you about kind of contraction, weakening, sequential composition. Yeah. yeah so sort of semi-ring structure to the grades, um, but it doesn't say anything about uh, exchange or associativity. So I was like, if you were wanting to think about connections, I was trying to figure out like how important is the associativity to you? I mean, we certainly have ideas about what that would look like in a graded setting, but yeah. um, I don't think we have that. We don't have that like completely worked out, so. Yeah, no. Yeah. But there's definitely this, you know, looking at this rule and the VAR rule, it's like, it has this, definitely has a graded flavor to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it definitely does. Yeah, nice. But perhaps it's graded flavor, but playing with the structural of associativity, which. Um... Yeah, like kind of moving it around, or, you know, there might be a way of kind of doing the palace based on grades or something. Yeah, it seems like the contraction and the weakening is kind of less important here because there's no, the palette, the palette seem to be like the, the grades for associativity right, more than anything else. Yeah, 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 the structure. Uh, yeah, I think that's the kind of way I'm interpreting this. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, well, all right, I think that uh, about sums it up. And uh, so thank you again. Uh, Mitchell, I thought that was really great. Um, and so it was a pleasure having you and um, I'll talk to you soon. Great. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And thanks everybody. Great. Thanks for the talk. Yeah. That was really, uh, that was really informative. Thank you. All right. I'm going to hit the stop screening.